Welcome to this edition of Onshore Connect. I'm your host, Heather Houghton. In this episode, water's evolving role in shale plays. But before we get started, I want to take a moment and thank everyone who made this episode possible. Hard Energy recently spoke with Jim Summers, CEO of H2O Midstream, about the impact of water on shale operators' bottom line and how the industry's approach towards water management is changing. Let's listen in. How has the industry dealt with the growing demand for water used for fracking with volumes reaching roughly 600,000 barrels or more? So the industry really wasn't ready for the, not just the logistics to move that water, but the physical infrastructure to get it from point A to point B. So historically, it might have been trucks that were used to transport that water. Well, that would be thousands of trucks. So you would need pipe, for example, but you're now moving from four inch pipe to 20 inch pipe. So just a very different impact. Same thing on the disposal side. We're seeing flowback volumes up to 20, 30,000 barrels a day, which in West Texas is three new disposal wells. So just the, the industry was not prepared for the stress that that would put on infrastructure. As l laterals get longer, more water is consumed per lateral, distances get further to source the water, and even landowners get more savvy about what they'll charge you for the water. So those costs are rising, but 10 to 30 percent um, is a typical sourcing cost. And again, by region, that may, may vary based on transportation. So in the Northeast, if I'm reusing, my sourcing cost might be very low because I'm able to just take my own water back and reuse. If I'm in the Permian Basin or in Eagleford and I don't have available surface water, I have to go to groundwater and that's a long way away, it, it could be significantly different. What are some of the challenges you see between transporting water via pipe versus truck? The biggest safety issue that we see in the water market is really trucking. So when you think about where there's the, the potential for fatality, for example, uh, that's the number one in almost every operation we look at. So I think that the, the, the first goal is really trying to get trucks off the highway and replace those with, with pipelines. In fact, our research shows that um, up to, you know, pipelines are 37 times safer uh, than, than trucks are in terms of potential fatality rates and spill rates and the like. The beauty of trucks is there's no commitment. You just hire a truck and you can move water. You don't really have to do much planning. You can live from sort of frack job to frack job. Now with the tremendous volumes, if you're going to make an infrastructure commitment, so you're going to build a pipeline or you're going to build fixed permanent facilities, that could take months if not years to permit and to plan. I would probably suggest it's always going to be an afterthought. Um, even natural gas is an afterthought. Um, takeaway capacity for natural gas is often an afterthought to um, development, drilling, the geology. ENPs are now beginning to see it through that light as well. Say so now understand the focus because it's having a significant impact on their bottom line. They're beginning to understand where in the value chain it affects their business, the transportation, the storage, the treatment. How does the cost of supply, disposal, and treatment for water recycling differ between the Marcellus and the Permian? we saw in the Northeast in the Marcellus is you had extremely high cost of disposal driven by regulatory frameworks. In the state of Pennsylvania, unlike Texas or Oklahoma, there were no fundamentally no disposal wells. So as production ramped up, producers' only choice to get rid of water was, it was to truck it essentially into Ohio, so almost 10 hours away. At the same time, there was a fundamental shift in the way that water treatment was done and used in, re, in um, hydraulic fracturing use. So three years ago, uh, the industry required fresh water in order to complete a hydraulic frack. Today, in the, the industry's moved away from gel and hybrid fracks in many cases to slick water fracks. They're able to use very dirty water. So you had the cost of treatment really dropping as well as the cost of disposal very high. So Pennsylvania went from almost no reuse to nearly 95 percent reuse within the state. In the Permian, uh, we've seen a very different dynamic, but it's changing. So in the Permian, disposal was readily accessible. Uh, it was pretty cheap. We had a very friendly regulatory environment in terms of transportation, um, disposal, and so you were able to, to effectively source and dispose cheaper than what you could reuse for. But what we're seeing happen now, the economics are changing as more and more producers are moving to slick water fracks. You're able to take the technology from the Marcellus and use it in the Permian to get cheaper and cheaper treatment and blending for reuse. That economic part of the equation ha has dropped. And at the same time, the, the impact on fresh water has risen significantly. So you now see the sourcing cost, the ability to go source water for wells, start to rise. So the combination of those two factors are driving reuse in the Permian. 
So, so the fundamental components which drive the economics are the same, but the variable impacts are different by region. And again, the regulations do matter, and they, they matter as they impact each of those different variables. How can shell producers deal with the logistics and costs of the increased need of water for operations? I think pre-planning is critical. I think having a partner that's, that can support them. You know, this is an entire business that's emerging. So you're talking about billions of dollars of pipeline infrastructure, management of storage, uh, potentially very, you know, co commercial trading opportunities around that. So, so I think it's, it's understanding the forward planning, how the market might unfold. But I think having a partner that's in that water business, uh, again, just like you would think about um, E&Ps having a gas partner or a midstream partner, water we see evolving the same way, that there needs to be a commitment and an understanding that that is a full-time emerging business model in and of itself. So we really think that's probably the most important thing that E&Ps can do is recognize the challenge and prepare um, via strong partnership and, and strong capabilities. What is required for the water logistics business to continue to grow? I was at in Fort Worth a few weeks ago at a conference and I remember Approach Resources, I think it was 80 to 90 billion dollars that they were estimating needed to be spent in the Permian Basin. Our research shows that's very, very low. We think it'll be several hundred billion dollars that will need to be invested. So the first thing that the industry needs is, is really investment into that space and, and we see primarily private equity filling that void. I think to me it's, it's dollars. It's multiple teams to come in and work with e &P, so You need a robust market, and ultimately you need trust. Onshore Connect returns next month with a look at the booming market for frack plugs. We want to thank you, the viewer, and everyone who made this episode possible. Until next time, let's stay connected. To stay up to date on the most recent Heart Energy videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here.